Five past nine tomorrow morning will come the 25th anniversary of a discovery which has changed the face of criminal justice and so much more besides. When Alec Jeffries, a geneticist at the University of Leicester, looked at some samples that morning in September 1984, he realised that everyone has their own distinctive genetic fingerprint. Since then, his discovery has been used to trap the guilty and to free the wrongly arrested. It's little exaggeration to say it has changed our world. Claire Marshall reports. Within seconds, it was obvious that we stumbled upon a, a DNA-based method, not only for biological identification, but also for sorting out family relationships. So it really was an extraordinary moment. DNA is the future and the past. You can reach in both directions with that. It's um, unbelievable what it can do. It has revolutionised the way we investigate all crime. It's added hugely to our capability to detect. From a person's blood or other body fluids, Alec Jeffries had discovered how to produce simple patterns of the genetic material DNA as characteristic and invariable as fingerprints. We call them genetic fingerprints. Knighted for his discovery, Professor Sir Alec Jeffries still works in the same laboratory in Leicester University, now overseeing the work of the next generation. He remembers back to that moment of revolutionary discovery a quarter of a century ago. The real um, issue was whether anybody would take notice. And my feeling was that, that DNA would be a very specialised technique used in a handful of cases where all other approaches have failed. So a, a technology, if you like, of last resort. So if you were to have told me back in those days, uh, in 1984, um, that we had started something which today more than 30 million people worldwide have been DNA profiled, a major tool in solving crime, the standard tool for sorting out paternity and immigration disputes, I think I would have laughed at you. But the new technique quickly attracted publicity when it helped to settle a difficult immigration case. Leicestershire police got in touch. They wanted Professor Jeffries' help in solving a double murder. Linda Mann was killed in 1983, Dawn Ashworth three years later. I took it on with a, a considerable degree of um, foreboding. Nobody had ever attempted a crime scene DNA analysis, a real-life crime scene DNA analysis before. And certainly when the samples arrived, I mean, the, 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 these were intimate samples from murder victims, it was a, that was a chilling moment, I have to say. That, that was something very different and not entirely pleasant in my life. But we took on the analysis and the full expectation we would get absolutely nothing back at all. And I have to say, to my astonishment, we got a really very clear readout from this, uh, which indicated that the, uh, the prime suspect who confessed to one of the murders, in fact, was not guilty of that crime. The proceedings against Mr Buckland shall be discontinued. Now armed with the DNA profile of the real killer, this is what followed. The first ever mass screening. 5,000 men from three villages close to Leicester volunteered samples of blood or saliva. Colin Pitchfork became the first person in the world to be convicted on the basis of DNA evidence. As a young and sort of mid-career detective, suddenly we had this stuff called DNA, um, and it began to make a difference to big, to big crime. Now it has revolutionised the way we investigate all crime, volume crime included. It's added hugely to our capability to detect, uh, and it's starting to be somewhere uh, that where, where it's the starting point of every crime investigation. A breakthrough technological development in the late 1980s enabled scientists to get a profile from the tiniest amounts of DNA. Alec Jeffries was able to identify the exhumed remains of the Auschwitz angel of death, Josef Mengele. Did Mengele's bones come here to your lab? Uh, they came here right into this very office. There was a prosecutor from Germany who came over uh, with a briefcase with various skeletal bits and pieces. So that was a very, very macabre moment. Sitting here in the office having the briefcase open and seeing these, these bits of skeleton, which I have to say were in extremely bad condition. Uh, so again, we took that on in the full expectation of getting nothing. But the, the sheer power of DNA amplification meant that it was possible to get a readout from amounts of human DNA less than a thousandth part of a millionth part of a gram of DNA. And there it is. 
a little tiny thing you can't even see but with a microscope. What saved my life. Kirk Bloodsworth was sentenced to death in 1984 for a brutal rape and murder which he didn't commit. While in prison, he happened to read about the emerging power of Professor Jeffrey's work. He pushed for the material evidence against him, semen stains and the victim's underwear, to be DNA tested. The result was clear. He said, Kirk, you're innocent, man, you're innocent. And I said, I know that. Your DNA test has come back and it's excluded you 100% as the person responsible for Dolan's murder. Kirk Bloodsworth became the first person in the US to be freed from death row because of DNA testing. With his persistence, it was also used to track down, a decade later, the real murderer. He believes that Alec Jeffries should get the Nobel Prize. Uh, Sir Isaac Newton said that if I see further, it is because I've stood on the shoulders of giants. Jeffries is one of those giants now and a phenomenal man. Can you show me where they got in? It's not just used in murders. This is a burglary. Chris Edgerly, a senior scenes of crime officer, has been with Thames Valley Police for more than 40 years. Once the, uh, the, the database was available, that was a huge leap forward uh, because now we have an opportunity to identify people uh, where we, didn't, we could never identify them before. Um, and, and of course, the more people that, that eventually end up on the database, the better chance we've got of identifying people. Even if an intruder wears gloves, he or she can still leave their DNA behind. And Chris here is trying to pick it up in this crime scene we're in at the moment. If they have an old pair of gloves, if they sneeze or if they touch their face with them, the DNA can be transferred to those gloves and Chris can find it. This is where the samples come to be tested and stored. The laboratories of the Forensic Science Service. And this is where the controversy lies. The combined British database now holds the profiles of more than five million people. In Scotland, the DNA of most of those arrested but not convicted is then deleted. But those profiles gathered in England and Wales are kept indefinitely. Last December, the European Court ruled that this was illegal, but the government has yet to change the law. We now have a database which is populated with Precise figures are hard to get, but the order of 800,000 entirely innocent people. That's bigger than the entire database of, of Germany or France, for example. So this does raise very serious issues of discrimination and breach of genetic privacy, stigmatization. There's a whole host of issues here. My view is very, very simple. It has been right from the outset. Innocent people do not belong that day to day. Branding them as future criminals is not proportionate uh, response in the, the fight against crime. From a personal view, I, I think that if uh, somebody's DNA profile was stored centrally, that that can only be of the benefit uh, for mankind, really. I can see why people don't like it. So you'd um, like everyone's profile to I, be I, I, I have no objection to it, because as far as I'm concerned, you know, I wouldn't do anything wrong, nor wouldn't do anything no, um, intentionally wrong, and uh, so I've got nothing to hide. When we look at serious crime in particular, a significant number of some of our most serious crimes have been detected from people who've come to notice not necessarily been fully charged, they might have been cautioned, or they might, they might not have been proceeded against. And for me there, the, the balance is one that Parliament has to make the judgment on. You know, how far do we want to go with that? It's up to me as a chief and for the police service to put forward the evidence and to base it on really good scientific evidence about the likelihood, the proportionality, the necessity. Hello. Hello. We did house-to-house -house inquiries for the murder of the taxi driver. But despite ago. calls from lawyers and civil liberties groups, Parliament still hasn't made a judgment as to where that balance should lie. Okay, the Home Office gave Newsnight a statement saying that draft laws would be published in due course. The science is developing at a much faster pace than the legislation. This is the lab where Professor Sir Alec Jeffries developed the DNA fingerprint. 25 years on, and this is one direction which the technology is taking. Commercial laboratories are offering these paternity testing kits. You can even just pick them up at chemist shops now. You take out the swab, get a little bit of a sample from the inside of your cheek, put it in this envelope and send it away. You can get the results within a week, or if you pay a bit more, even by the end of the working day. This private laboratory in Norwich, specialising in paternity cases, analyses DNA samples sent in by thousands of people each month. 
Even the scientists working here are very conscious of the privacy risks. I think the, the public are very suspicious of anything, of anything new, and rightly so. And uh, they, they need to know that, for example, their DNA <laughs> is going to be used in, a, in, in a, an ethical manner and for, for the purposes for which they want it to be used. And also, there is a massive issue with, uh, for example, insurance, life insurance, people getting genetic testing for that. I, I think people are, are right to be suspicious of this until there is proper legislation in place. As soon as the sun came up, you couldn't catch any of them. But over in the US, Kirk Bloodsworth is fully behind the expansion of genetic testing. He wants to secure the release of all those wrongfully convicted. He's already managed to secure $15 million of federal funding in a program to help states pay for DNA profiling. I know there's more mistakes out there. And, you know, some of these people are going to languish away in prison or lose their life. And none of us should ever sentence a innocent person to death or into prison for anything. Um, that price uh, for democracy is too high. Professor Jeffries believes that the next 25 years could see even more dramatic evolutions in genetic science. In terms of future uses, there is great potential there, and there's great talk about personalised medicine, that you can, understanding diversity in an individual's uh, genome, you can then start tailoring medicines, tailoring drugs to attack the specific medical problems that those people have. Now, whether that's going to happen and whether that would be uh, economically viable, uh, for example, within the National Health Service, I mean, that, that's something we just have to wait and see. He believes that the DNA revolution has only just begun.